Hello, this is Red Wagner with Marxism Today. Today's episode is part four of A Strange Labor. This is from the text A Strange Labor out of the Philosophic and Economic Manuscripts by Karl Marx. Uh, if you haven't been following along, this is a reading where I'll be reading straight from the text and providing some commentary as we go through. So without further ado, let's get into the text. We took our departure from a fact of political economy, the estrangement of the worker and his production. We have formulated this fact in conceptual terms as estranged, alienated labor. We have analyzed this concept, hence analyzing merely a fact of political economy. Let us now see further how the concept of estranged, alienated labor must express and present itself in real life. If the product of labor is alien to me, if it confronts me as an alien power, to whom then does it belong? To a being other than myself. Who is this being? The gods? To be sure, in the earliest times, the principal production, for example, in the building of temples in Egypt, India, Mexico, appears to be in the service of the gods and the product belongs to the gods. However, the gods on their own were never the lords of labor. No more was nature. And what a contradiction it would be if the more man subjugated nature by his labor, and the more the miracles of the gods were rendered superfluous by the miracles of industry, the more man were to renounce the joy of production and the enjoyment of the product to please these powers. The alien being to whom labor and the product of labor belongs, in whose service labor is done, and for whose benefit the product of labor is provided, can only be man himself. If the product of labor does not belong to the worker, if it confronts him as an alien power, then this can only be because it belongs to some other man than the worker. If the worker's activity is a torment to him, to another it must give satisfaction and pleasure. Not the gods, not nature, but only man himself can be this alien power over man. We must bear in mind the previous position that man's relation to himself becomes for him objective and actual through his relation to other man. Thus, if the product of his labor, his labor objectified, is for him an alien, hostile, powerful object independent of him, then his position towards it is such that someone else is master of this object, someone who is alien, hostile, and powerful, and independent of him. If he treats his own activity as an unfree activity, then he treats it as an activity performed in the service, under the dominion, the coercion, and the yoke, of another man. So far, what Marx does in this section of uh, estranged labor is to set up the other side of the coin here. We know that uh, man is estranged from the product of his labor and that he is alienated from the process of labor. In other words, he doesn't get to keep the things he makes and he doesn't get to decide how he makes them. The other side of this is that someone else must be doing those things. Someone else must own those objects when he is done and someone else must be deciding for him how to do his work. He sets up kind of this philosophical argument where he says, well, could it be the gods? No, it's not the gods. Could it be nature? No, it's not nature. In this case, it is only another man. Okay, now we're going to get into some class divisions. Every estrangement of man from himself and from nature appears in the relation in which he places himself and nature to men other than and differentiated from himself. For this reason, religious self-estrangement necessarily appears in the relationship of the layman to the priest, or again to a mediator, etc., since we are dealing with the intellectual world. In the real, practical world, self-estrangement can only become manifest through the real, practical relationship to other men. The medium through which estrangement takes place is itself practical. Thus, through estranged labor, man not only creates his relationship to the object and to the act of production as powers that are alien and hostile to him, he also creates the relationship in which other men stand to his production and to his product, and the relationship in which he stands to these other men. 
just as he creates his own production as the loss of his reality as his punishment, his own product as a loss, as a product not belonging to him, so he creates the domination of the person who does not produce over production and over the product. Just as he estranges his own activity from himself, so he confers upon the stranger an activity which is not his own. Okay, here Marx is just pointing out that one in the same activity both estranges the worker from products and the labor process, but also gives that power to another person. These aren't two separate things. It's one activity that takes away the power from the worker and gives it to this other person who we will soon find is the capitalist. But these are related. Because if the worker were all of a sudden in control of his labor process and owned what he produced, then those things could no longer be controlled and owned by the capitalist. So it's a dependent relationship here. The one can only be exploited if the other one is doing exploiting. Okay, the one can only benefits because the other loses. We have, until now, considered this relationship only from the standpoint of the worker, and later on we will be considering it also from the standpoint of the non-worker. Through estranged, alienated labor, then, the worker produces the relationship to this labor of a man alien to labor and standing outside of it. The relationship of the worker to labor creates the relationship to it of the capitalist, or whatever one chooses to call the master of labor. Private property is thus the product, the result, the necessary consequence of alienated labor, of the external relation of the worker to nature and to himself. Private property thus results by analysis from the concept of alienated labor, i.e. of alienated man, of estranged labor, of estranged life, of estranged man. Here Marx is going to get into the relationship between alienated labor and estrangement and how that's connected to private property. And when he says private property here, it makes the most sense to think of it as private property of the means of production. So not things like your clothes, your toothbrush, your bed, your personal items, but private property in the sense of owning a factory or owning an entire industry or owning an entire business. That's the kind of private property we're talking about. True, it is the result of the movement of private property that we have obtained the concept of alienated labor, of alienated life in political economy. But on analysis of this concept, it becomes clear that though private property appears to be the reason, the cause of alienated labor, it is rather its consequence. Just as the gods are originally not the cause, but the effect of man's intellectual confusion. Later, this relationship becomes reciprocal. So Marx here is simply saying that estrangement comes first, that alienation comes first, that first workers are exploited, and then later we develop the concept, the legal concept of private property, not the other way around. Only at the culmination of the development of private property does this, its secret, appear again. Namely, that on one hand it is the product of alienated labor, and on the other it is the means by which labor alienates itself, the realization of this alienation. In other words, later on these two elements, alienation and exploitation, develop a reciprocal relationship. They support each other in certain ways. This exposition immediately sheds light on various hitherto unsolved conflicts. 1. Political economy starts from labor as the real soul of production. Yet to labor it gives nothing, and to private property, everything. Confronting this contradiction, Proudhon has decided in favor of labor against private property. We understand, however, that this apparent contradiction is the contradiction of estranged labor with itself, and that political economy has merely formulated the laws of estranged labor. We also understand, therefore, that wages and private property are identical. Indeed, where the product as the object of labor pays for labor itself, there the wage is but a necessary consequence of labor's estrangement. 
Likewise, in the wage of labor, labor does not appear as an end in itself, but as the servant of the wage. We shall develop this point later, and meanwhile we'll only draw some conclusions. An enforced increase of wages, disregarding all other difficulties, including the fact that it would only be by force, too, and that such an increase would be an anomaly, uh, could be maintained, would therefore be nothing but better payment for the slave, and would not win, either for the worker or for labor, the human status of dignity. Indeed, even the equality of wages, as demanded by Proudhon, only transforms the relationship of the present-day worker to his labor into the relationship of all other men to labor. Society would then be conceived as an abstract capitalist. Here Marx is addressing uh, other radical and socialist thinkers of his time, namely Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, and highlighting that his approach, which looks at all of these things in a connected way, is more holistic and is going to tackle the problem at its heart more so than thinkers like Proudhon will see. Wages are a direct consequence of estranged labor, and estranged labor is the direct cause of private property. The downfall of one must therefore involve the downfall of the other. From this relationship of estranged labor to private property, it follows further that the emancipation of society from private property, etc., from servitude, is expressed in the political form of the emancipation of the workers. Not that their emancipation alone is at stake, but because the emancipation of the workers contains universal human emancipation, and it contains this because the whole of human servitude is involved in the relation of the worker to production, and the relations of servitude are but modifications and consequences of this relation. Here Marx is saying that all kinds of wrongs and oppression that happens in society is very much connected to the process of production, and that without changing how we organize production, we won't be able to fully emancipate the whole of humanity. Just as we have derived the concept of private property from the concept of estranged alienated labor by analysis, so we can develop every category of political economy with the help of these two factors. And we shall find again in each category, trade, competition, capital, money, only a particular and developed expression of these first elements. But before considering this phenomenon, however, let us try to solve two other problems. Once again, Marx is just pointing out that looking at alienation and looking at the private property of the means of production, these are two things that we can apply to look at all of these other economic phenomenon like trade, competition, capital, the accumulation of money, things like this. Uh, so let's look at the two problems now. One, to define the general nature of private property as it has arisen as a result of estranged labor in its relation to truly human and social property. And two, we have accepted the estrangement of labor, its alienation, as a fact, and we have analyzed this fact. How, we now ask, does man come to alienate, to estrange his labor? How is this estrangement rooted in the nature of human development? We have already gone a long way to the solution of this problem by transforming the question of the origin of private property into the question of the relation of alienated labor to the course of humanity's development. For when one speaks of private property, one thinks of dealing with something external to man. When one speaks of labor, one is directly dealing with man himself. This new formation of the question already contains the solution. As to the general nature of private property and its relation to truly human property. Alienated labor has resolved itself for us in two components, which depend on one another, or which are but different expressions of one and the same relationship. Appropriation appears as estrangement, as alienation, and alienation appears as appropriation, estrangement as truly becoming a citizen. Here again, Marx is showing the connection between 
alienation and appropriation, which you could use the word exploitation there. We have considered the one side, alienated labor, in relation to the worker himself, i.e. the relation of alienated labor to itself. The product, the necessary outcome of this relationship, as we have seen, is the property relation of the non-worker to the worker and to labor. Private property, as the material summary expression of alienated labor, embraces both relations, the relation of the worker to work and to the product of his labor and to the non-worker, and the relation of the non-worker to the worker and the product of his labor. In other words, Marx is saying here that understanding this concept of estranged labor that we've been looking at this episode and the previous three, we can see the real important parts, which are the relationship of the worker to his product of work, what he makes, the relationship of the worker to the work process, how he doesn't have control over it, and the relationship of the worker to his boss, the capitalist, or the ruling class. We can also look at the relationship of the capitalist to other workers and the relationship of the capitalist to the things that his workers make. He gets them and sells them for more money. Having seen that in relation to the worker who appropriates nature by means of his labor, this appropriation appears as estrangement, his own spontaneous activity as activity for another, and as activity of another, vitality as the sacrifice of life, production of the po object as the loss of the object to an alien power, to an alien person. We shall now consider the relation to the worker, to labor, and its object of the person who is alien to labor and the worker. First, it is to be noted that everything which appears in the worker as an activity of alienation, of estrangement, appears in the non-worker as the state of alienation, of estrangement. Secondly, that the worker's real practical attitude and production to the product appears in the non-worker as a theoretical attitude. Let us now look more closely at these relations. And this is where Marx ends the first manuscript, uh, which of course leads into the second manuscript, which will have to be an issue for another day. Thanks for listening. This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com, where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.